you so very much for, for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, you spoke about the White House. I don't want you to think like the President and I are drinking buddies or anything like that, but I do want to share something with you. If you're not familiar with The Voice, that was a Valentine's Day gift from First Lady Michelle Obama this past February on the first anniversary of the creation of her Let's Move initiative that strives to get people eating better and moving or, or exercising. Um, the White House has been an immense supporter, as has been the U.S. government and many other organizations. Um, I was going to start with something. I'm just going to say, I think people grow up thinking a dreaming, rather, at some point in their life, they want to be something special. I wanted to be Superman. Uh, some people want to be an astronaut or the president of the United States or a rock star or an athlete. But the majority of us never get a chance to be the hero that we'd like to be. And I'm going to show you how we have the opportunity for 40 plus million in this country to become heroes that they never knew that they could be. I'm going to start with another point. Normally, I'm speaking in front of a presentation, and I can point to things, and you can see stuff on the screen. Well, you got Fernie's sign in ampleharvest.org, which I just found out yesterday has a misspelling in it. So if you can find it, good for you. But I'm going to have to use some color to describe the pictures that you're not seeing. So bear with me on this. There are 50 million food insecure people in America. Now, food insecurity is a fancy word, and it basically means either you're hungry or you're at real risk of being hungry. If you open up your cup cupboard and there's a single can of tuna fish, you're not hungry yet, but you're at real risk. That's food insecurity. We're talking about one out of four children in America under the age of six living in a food insecure home. And in the Hispanic community, it's one out of three. 50 million is a big number. I was always bad in math. So I want to put this in perspective, and this is where I'm going to have to paint a picture with words, so just stick with me for a minute. Alaska, Arkansas, Connecticut, Delaware, Hawaii, Idaho, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Maine, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, New Hampshire, New Mexico, Nevada, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Oregon, Rhode Island, South Dakota, Vermont, and West Virginia. I've read you the name of 23 of our 50 states. And if you took the combined populations of those 23 states, you now have 50 million people. So that's the scope and the magnitude of the problem we have in America where people who don't have access to healthy food or an adequate supply of food in, in general. The people who go, who, the people in this population, and I want to say one other thing. This is, these people are not necessarily the chronically poor that you think about on the other side of the railroad tracks. They may be you, they may be your next door neighbor. This is one out of six people uh, in America, and if this had been a larger audience, what I would have said is what I've said in other speeches. Look around you for as far as your arm can reach. If you are not food insecure, somebody within arm's reach of you is. That's how common, unfortunately, and in our economy today, it may well be your middle class next door neighbor who got laid off, and they're struggling to keep the home, and they're struggling to pay the bills. It's not them. This is now us. This is an American problem, and we have an American solution. The people who, have, who are food insecure typically go to what here in the Northwest is called a food bank. I mean, much of America is called a food pantry. In some places, they're called food cupboards, food shelves, or food closets. I'm going to use the word food pantry, even though that's not what's used in Washington, Oregon. I'm going to do that for a reason, because I want to make a distinction. Food banks throughout most of America are large industrial warehouse operations. It's Think of it like a factory-sized thing where tractor trailer loads of food come in and gets inventoried in a big warehouse. Think of that as a food bank. 
food pantries are these little organizations in a house of worship, in a YMCA, they're in the community. 33,500 of them across America. The pantry goes to the food bank to get food, it comes back to the pantry and then they get to the people in need. So I'm making the distinction in this discussion because I want you to understand when I'm talking about a big food bank and I'm talking about the neighborhood food pantry. Here I know in Washington it is food bank is used, the same word is used. The food bank system as it exists today is designed to handle an amazing amount of processed food and very efficiently. The tractor trailer loads are coming in. I was at the Lifelines Food Bank here in Seattle yesterday, and it's a typical one. It's a large operation. The one thing that they can't handle very well is produce because of the delivery cycle with the food pantries. Now, for those of you who have ever gone to a food drive in your house of worship, in your business, in your school, what's the one thing they always say? Can, yes, non perishables Cans, boxes, jars, no fresh food. The reason for that is the delivery cycle between the food bank and the food pantry can be measured in days or weeks or months and fresh food doesn't work. I'm a master gardener and in uh, 2007 I had a very large amount of food in my garden. My wife came to me and said you're not bringing any more of that stuff in the house. And I grew up as a kid in the 50s with the uh, mantra of there are kids starving in Europe, finish what's on your plate. And so we got used to the idea of you don't waste food. If it's in front of you, you eat it. So this idea of wasting food that I grew was really gnawed at me and I found a battered woman's shelter in my town and I donated the food. And one of the things that struck me as I left, the woman who answered the door says, thank God, now we can have some fresh food. And it sounded like a strange thing for me to hear. What it? Are you only getting canned food? The following year, 2008, the exact same thing, uh, and the same woman answers the, the, the door, and, I give, and she said the exact same thing. Thank you, now we can have some fresh food. I didn't know that I was getting a glimpse of the life of 50 million Americans. Move forward just a little bit. 2008, late in the year, I was asked to take over the directorship of a community garden in my town. It was already existing. The woman who created it was moving on. I at first didn't want to do it because frankly I have my own garden stuff but they badgered me so I took it. While we are having a set up meeting in late 09, one of the people says to me, you know it really bothers me, August, September, people are bored, they're overwhelmed, there's food and it's being left to rot in the garden. And I said, you know if we're going to have an ample harvest at least we can do it, give it to people who need it just rolled off my tongue. That sentence got you folks here today. What ended up happening was that uh, we, they thought it was a great idea. They put a committee together to sort of organize this. And as a director, my job was to look for a food pantry or the food pantries in my town. Google said the nearest food pantry was 25 miles away in Morristown. And I knew that was wrong because I was already donating to a, a shelter. I realized that if I'm having this problem, so are 40 million other gardeners in America. Now remember, I hate waste. Um, the next morning I'd gotten up, I just for the hell of it went on the internet to see if ampleharvest.org as a domain taken, and it wasn't. So I signed up and I spent $9, which put me in a problem because I had spent the $9 and I don't like wasting things. This was the beginning of the pieces that evolved into seven weeks later the rollout of a national program called ampleharvest.org. It was the collaborative work of three people. Myself, a woman in Missouri who I've never met who donated her time and talent and who is a former food pantry client and still lives in Section 8 housing and she's an amazing artist and a guy in New Jersey who did the data engine in the background. So anything on ampleharvest.org, if it's pretty, she did it. If it's hard work, he did it. And if it's something you can read, I did it. But that's how we got it out. And the other thing, seven weeks was easy to do because we had no lawyers involved in the picture. So that, that was easy to do. Um, once we had gotten it out, we then started promoting it. We, I started promoting it. This was an aging hippie with a really cool idea. And I had to introduce America to the idea that we have food in our backyard and we have food pantries so we could use it. And I had to build this thing up. And it continued to build up and build up and build up. What I realized what was going on, that we had 40 million growers in America who did not know that they could donate food. 
and we had, at the time, 28,500 food pantries in America who did not know that they could get food. That number, unfortunately, has since grown out of 33,500 pantries. So we had a disconnect in the community. The food was there, the need was there, and what I ended up doing was connecting the dots. What made ampleharvest.org work so well is I didn't touch the food. I was connecting the grower to the food pantry. This was a community building opportunity. Once the grower knew that the food pantry was in their community, he or she would presumably then donate food for the rest of their gardening life. Furthermore, that person now became the vector through which this information spread to their network of friends in the community. That person became the hero in their own community. And every gardener who starts donating becomes the hero in their own community because that person is reducing hunger, they're reducing malnutrition, and helping the environment all at the same time by reaching into their backyard instead of their back pocket. Now, I want to explain these benefits because this is actually really, really important. From the hunger side, admittedly, by and large in America, we don't have people sprawling on the, street, on the streets, starving like you might see in some third world countries. We do, however, have very hungry people. The other side of the problem, by the way, which is what Graham really touched on, is that it's not that we have people who are starving. We are an exceedingly malnourished yet overfed society. People eating too much of absolutely the wrong stuff. Unfortunately, for people who don't have the money, uh, um, cheap calories are the worst ones, but they're the ones you can afford to buy. It's a real unfortunate problem. We've just, what I've discovered is that the opposite of hunger isn't full, it's health. And this is part of what we're trying to, um, um, trying to get at. So building this connection allowed a community building activity to take place within the community. It doesn't rely on Washington, it doesn't rely on state capital, and it doesn't rely on more money. It actually relies on the extra seeds that you planted in your garden, or the extra uh, um, produce that you got in your garden to take care of your neighbors in need, and to do so in perpetuity. Gardeners can go to a garden shop, get a small packet of seeds, a dollar or two, they can plant it, they can get dozens or hundreds of dollars worth of food, keep what they need, and give the rest away for free. Individual gardeners become philanthropists in their own way, not unlike what the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, and the Gates have become. 